uh, good evening everyone and another episode of step program star teachers in plastic surgery the next generation today is the episode 14 the last the final episode of this season 1 the first uh, topic will be management of orbital floor fractures and the speaker will be dr alagar raja he has done his mch from kilpock medical college chennai from 2008 to 2011 he has done further a fellowship for diabetic foot lymphedema and super micro surgery at asan medical center seoul south korea and the professor jp hong dr alagar raja is now professor at the department of plastic and reconstructive surgery and sip rcs Savita Institute of Plastic Reconstructive Aesthetic and Craniofacial Surgery Savita Medical College and Hospital His fields of interest are facial maxillary microvascular and aesthetic And the person moderating this session today will be Professor M P Hari Haran professor at the Institute for Research and Rehabilitation of Hand and Department of Plastic Surgery Government Stanley Hospital and Stanley Medical College Chennai without further ado we shall go over to the first session management of orbital floor fractures handing over to nc sir hari haran sir uh, i give the introduction or you will you can you start can the topic the, you can start you can start i mean i can give he can talk and then you can give your comments sir yeah 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 i think you can start with the topic yes thank you sir Sir, visible, sir. Screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor G K for giving the opportunity. So the topic is management of orbital floor fractures. Isolated orbital fractures accounts for four to sixteen percent of all facial fractures. Along with the ZMC and NOE fractures, it accounts for 30 to 55 percent of all facial fractures. Uh, ZMC fracture is the most common fracture uh, occurring with the orbital fracture. Orbital fractures are due to interpersonal violence, road traffic accident, and sport injuries. Anatomy: Orbit is a pyramidal bony wall containing eyeball. Uh, with the base anteriorly and the apex posteriorly the average adult volume is 30 cc growth of the orbit is completed 80% by 5 uh, years and it is completed between 7 years to puberty orbit is formed of seven bones maxilla zygomatic frontal ethmoidal palatine lacrimal and sphenoid and it has got four walls roof floor uh, medial wall and lateral wall roof and lateral wall are thick walls floor and medial wall are thin walls This is a CT picture showing the bones uh, uh, contributing to the formation of the orbital cavity. So, some key reference points uh, relevant to the surgery: frontal ethmoidal suture. It is two-third up the medial wall, corresponds to the level of cribriform fluid. It forms the superior extent of the medial wall dissection, anterior ethmoidal foramen. It is 20 to 25 millimeter from the rim, and uh, anterior ethmoidal artery passes through the foramen. Posterior ethmoidal foramen is 12 millimeter from the anterior ethmoidal foramen, and the posterior ethmoidal artery passes through the foramen. Posterior ethmoidal foramen uh, <coughs> forms the posterior extent of safe uh, dissection of the medial wall. An optic canal is 42 millimeter is from the rim, and the safe extent of dissection along the floor is 32 millimeter. and along the lateral wall superior orbital fissure forms the safe limit of dissection so coming to a hammer's key area or posterior medial aspect of the floor or uh, it, it is also called as posterior medial bulge this area forms the key support mechanism to maintain the vertical position and the anterior projection of the globe so during reconstruction uh, reconstructing this area forms the key to restore the normal globe position coming to the types of uh, fractures isolated orbital uh, floor fractures or pure fractures 
uh, it may be linear or trap door fractures common in pediatric age group or blow in, blow out fracture blow in fractures complex fractures floor fractures associated with rim and other fractures clinical examination we have to check for periorbital ecchymosis subconjunctival hemorrhage paresthesia of the inferior orbital nerve check visual acuity, acuity uh, check for ocular mobility motility and you have to check for diplopia check for the globe position and uh, palpate the orbital rim for step crepitus or mobility the patient complains of loss of vision visual field loss no light perception then suspect optic nerve injury always take the help of an ophthalmologist uh, uh, for fundoscopic examination and to check the vision of the patient this is a picture to show the globe position uh, in the hypoglobus the globe is uh, positioned inferiorly compared to the contralateral eye in inophthalmos the globe is positioned posteriorly compared to the contralateral eye vboff white eye blow out fracture coined by jordan et al in 1998 common in pediatric age group uh, there may uh, there may be discrete evidence of fracture in the imaging studies minimal to no soft tissue trauma there may, uh, there may be no subconjunctival hemorrhage hence it is called white eye blow out fracture the patient usually presents with a restriction of ocular motility and along with the vomiting so investigations gold standard is ct scan 3 mm cuts for floor and uh, roof fractures and 1 to 1.5 mm cuts for optic canal mri is occasionally taken to rule out optic nerve injury and associated brain injury is an x-ray uh, plain x-ray showing the orbital blow out fracture with the tear drop sign ct scan coronal view showing the orbital blow out fracture of the floor with the herniation of content in the maxillary sinuses another blow out fracture showing the orbital emphysema what are the biomechanics of the orbital fracture there are two theories are there hydraulic theory by smith and converse in which the blow is directed to the globe which increases the intra orbital pressure uh, causing decompressing fractures in the adjacent sinuses and buckling theory by figino where the blow is given to the strong uh, outer rim which causes the buckling effect of the orbital walls and which results in the fracture jan queries jan queries classification of orbital floor defects there are five categories category 1 is the low risk and the, from category 3 it is a high risk fractures so category 1 uh, the fracture size is less than 2 uh, cm in category 2 the fracture size is more than 2 uh, cm the point is the bony ledge along the median margin of the inferior orbital fissure is preserved which is a key point for reconstruction and in category 3 the defect is more than 2 cm but the bony ledge along the inferior orbital fissure is missing will be missing and category 4 the entire orbital floor is involved with a missing bony ledge and the category 5 the fracture extends into the roof so what are the indications for surgery persistent diplopia positive force duction test ct evidence of uh, muscle entrapment no clinical improvement uh, for more than 2 weeks in ophthalmos more than 3 mm significant globe ptosis orbital floor defect more than 50% so when to intervene there are two two concepts are there uh, according to smith and converts early they suggested early intervention that is before two weeks and potterman and coworkers they have suggested uh, delayed approach which is uh, wait and watch approach more than uh, we have to wait up to two weeks so the bernstein criteria for orbital surgery timing it has got three categories immediate which is less than 24 hours mostly for uh, fractures presenting uh, with the significant diplopia and globe, uh, significant compromise in the globe position and uh, white side blow out fracture comes under this category and early um, early early approach is 1 to 14 days uh, in which there is no significant uh, improvement um, uh, after uh, waiting for a considerable time in uh, like uh, for conditions like diplopia or uh, inferior orbital anesthesia and delayed approach where uh, there is a uh, other uh, Uh, the diplopia and other conditions seems to improve then we can wait and watch so access to the orbit two approaches are there 
transcutaneous approach and transconjunctival approach transcutaneous three three approaches are that subciliary or lower brifloplasty subtarsal or lower lidded crease crease incision or infraorbital so what are the aims of surgery to restore anatomy restore volume to restore eye movements restore aesthetics and to prevent vision uh, subciliary approach it gives access to the orbital floor rim or infraorbital rim and lateral rim the incision is usually placed just below the eyelash eyelashes there are three approaches to subciliary incision one is the skin only flap and another is the skin and muscle flap since these uh, approaches are associated with high rate of ectropia and around 6 to 8% uh, the preferred technique is step dissection of uh, converse which accounts for less scarring and very good scar so in subciliary dissection step approach the pretarsal skin flap of 4 to 6 mm uh, leaving pretarsal muscle intact this is the key point we have to preserve the pretarsal muscle uh, intact to prevent the lid drop in the post operative period and the orbicularis oculi muscle is approached in the preseptal plane the skin and muscle flap raised or and retracted and dissection continued down to the intro, uh, orbital rim uh, once the periosteum is incised then dissection is continued in the subperiosteal plane to reach the floor subtarsal approach lower eyelid skin crease approach gives access to floor and orbital rim the incision is placed below the inferior margin of lower tarsus starts medially and courses in a lateral caudal direction the sequence of dissection is skin orbicularis oculi infraorbital rim periorbitum and bone muscle is uh, in this incision muscle is dissected from lateral to medial direction in the suborbicularis preseptal plane once the rim is visualized periorbitum is incised and dissection is carried in the subperiosteal plane uh, closure is done in layers periosteum muscle and skin the precaution to be taken during this dissection is to avoid the fat herniation to the operative field dissection must be uh, must continue in the preseptal plane and second thing is the periorbita incision should be placed below the arcus marginalis which is confluence of the septum with the uh, periorbitum to protect the cornea you can use a corneal shield or we can go for a temporary torsography another precaution to be taken while going for the lower eyelid uh, approach is the application of frost sutures to the lower eyelid uh, it creates traction and lengthens the lower eyelid uh, during the first uh, phase of healing and it prevents the vertical scar contraction transconjunctival approach uh first suggest i mean done by tessier and converse in 1973 three approaches are there inferior fornix approach for the floor medial transcurrencular for medial wall and uh, with a lateral extension for the lateral rim and the wall the inferior fornix approach two roots are there retroseptal roots uh, where the uh, dissection is carried into the fat compartments of the lower eyelid preseptal root where the dissection is done Uh, below the lower tarsal border in this sub orbicularis oculi preseptal plane retroseptal root the uh, incision is done in the depth of the fornix incision is done for about 8 mm including the lower eyelid retractus the conjunctiva and the lower eyelid retractus are undermined and extended from laterally to medially uh, the dissection is carried um, once there it is retracted the dissection is carried to the edge of the rim and Uh, then the periorbital is incised to access the floor the preseptal root which is the preferred root the conjunctival incision is done below the lower tarsal border suborbicularis oculi preseptal space is entered blunt preseptal dissection is done to reach the infraorbital rim the periorbital incision is done and subperiosteal dissection is done to uh, reach the floor the advantage of this approach is the bloodless feel and lower incidence of ectropia on the entropia transconjunctival approach has got uh, a little bit higher rate of complications and uh, uh, particularly corneal injury and eyelid mal positions ectropion and entropion and in ophthalmos again the precaution to be taken for a cornea corneal shield can be used if not the posterior edge of the flap can be sutured to the upper lid margin to give a protection to the cornea so Uh, still the uh, transconjunctival approach um, uh, can be done 
the advantage is the superior cosmos is the only thing is it requires high precision and uh, it has got a limited access so coming to the reconstruction materials uh, used for the orbital floor titanium mesh porous polyethylene sheet bone graft conical cartilage uh, titanium mesh is readily available and it prevents the donor site uh, dissection on time i mean why we can avoid uh, extra surgery time now we have got even preformed an anatomical plate um, <clears throat> so we can uh, our suggestion is to go for a titanium mesh at, at uh, certain instances we have also gone for a uh, conical cartilage but we don't have experience with the porous polyethylene sheet or a bone graft so post op care the patient should be kept in upright position to improve the periorbital edema and pain uh, uh patient should be ad advised to avoid a nose blowing to prevent orbital emphysema medications apart from antibiotics and analgesics nasal decongestant steroids and ophthalmic ointment can be given we give steroid uh, for 3 days we give dexamethasone for 3 days so all these drugs are only optional so all uh, post op period should uh, 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 done with a um, complete ophthalmic examination particularly to check the vision extracular motion we have to check for diplopia we have to check for globe position if there is ap4 then check for lacrimal duct injury post operative imaging it's our choice you can go for a plain x ray or we can go for a ct scan sutures are removed in the 5 days so follow up again the same points check for globe position check for diplopia vision lid problems and check for scar so the a few operative pictures the first picture shows the uh, subtarsal incision subtarsal incision and this picture shows the uh, exposure of the orbicularis oculi and uh, we can see the completed orbital floor dissection in the both the pictures this is the malleable copper uh, retractor we use uh, which is a, a very useful uh, instrument and this is the pre op picture of the patient and this is the post op picture the advantage of subtarsal incision is the uh, uh, hardly we can uh, identify the scar so another case of subtarsal uh, approach uh, completed orbital floor dissection you can see the uh, the floor reconstruction of floor with the titanium mesh, mesh plate transconjunctival approach again the preceptal route uh, here you can see the uh conjunctival flap has been uh, sutured to give the protection to the cornea um orbital remnants approach uh, fracture is exposed for repair uh i want i would like to play a couple of videos uh for the both approaches Uh, Alagad Raja, you have to stop sharing. Stop share. Put it in. Sir, you have to play the play. Sir, is it stop share? It's not sharing. You have to put stop share. Sir, sir. Sir, video is not visible, sir. Yeah, it's not visible. You put stop share. You have to stop yes. sharing the screen. Okay, sir. Then again, put share. Yes. Now again, start share. Okay, sir. Then play on your video. Okay, sir. Just a minute, sir. Shall I, sir? Yeah. Now you can click on the video.
sir shall i little bit fast forward sir shall i yes. whatever important stuff you want to show you can one more video sir sir one more video for just 10 seconds sir just i want to highlight that video sir this is the uh, real time uh, navigation guided 
orbital floor surgery which we have started in collaboration with the Aravind Eye Hospital and what you are seeing this is the skull post uh, that transmits the data to the monitor and this is the uh, tracer or the pointer which collects the data and uh, we have just only done two cases two early uh, just we are in the learning phase probably in uh, la probably later we can come up with a good series of cases and uh, you can see the monitor from where the data is transmitted sir uh, powerpoint is visible sir yeah yes sorry sir powerpoint is powerpoint is visible sir yes yeah yes. yeah sir sir this is the, again the same thing sir the real time navigation guided orbital flow surgery which we have started and uh, this is the uh, or, original setup in aravindai hospital where we have uh, performed the procedure just uh, this is the latest thing we have done thank you sir yeah you can you can stop sharing screen yes sir yes sir dr nc sir will take over yeah, i have few questions to yes sir professor arigat raja first yes, i thank you because this facial maxillary it's unfortunately not many plastic surgeons are showing attention not many are taking it seriously uh, partly because of lack of exposure i can firmly say so much that when i go for exams the first request that is often coming from the the internal examiners is our people are not having adequate exposure to facial mask so often they are not exposed at all so that is a problem we face i mean what is your preferred insertion and what is your suggested insertion for somebody who wants to take up yes, hospital yes. floor fractures yes sir sir uh, our preferred incision is subtarsal sir it is the simplest approach we can go for and uh, so far uh, with our with our experience we can firmly say that uh, uh, th there is no complication like uh, ectropion or entropion very safe very straightforward and very simple approach and uh, we have attempted in fact we have attempted we have attempted subciliary approach Act uh, we had complications then we ventured into the subtarsal and we are very comfortable nowadays either uh, uh, we prefer only subtarsal for selected cases only we go for transconjunctival particularly like isolated floor fractures uh, only we prefer uh, transconjunctival otherwise we are very comfortable with the uh, subtarsal and we even uh, we, we strongly recommend subtarsal approach sir it's very easy and very straightforward it has got a very uh, uh, thin learning curve Uh, i think all the surgeons i mean uh, interested in taking up orbital surgery can go for uh, subtarsal incisions do you suggest to delineate a line a subtarsal line no sir actually it is uh, actually it is not uh, to be precise it is we check the uh, lower right eyelid skin crease sir which uh, which gets buried into the fold we check for that uh, skin crease that is below the tarsal level Uh, that is what uh, it has been shown in the video also we check the preoperatively also we check the uh, incision and we even educate the patient that this is where we have to go we are going to put the incision and we will show them the set uh, post op pictures of uh, patients that is 3 to 4 months post op where they don't have any scars so we convince the patient then only we take up for surgery sir at the moment we say that we are going to put the incision there most of the patients they object particularly female patients they say but we convince them by showing the uh, post op pictures uh, isolated uh, floor fractures without rim simple fractures linear fractures we we strongly recommend transconjunctival approach sir. yeah the one suggestion actually the lower yes, tarsal plate is only yes, 5 mm in height yes, just 5 yes, mm yes, so yes, avoid the subciliary put a incision anywhere and then retract yes, the skin it is very hard for you to injure the tarsal plate naturally you will be in the subtarsal plate you need not yes. be very think that is yeah of course you also prefer that i prefer subtarsal or tarsal or subtarsal insertion approach is subtarsal there is no yes. doubt about it and scar is not visible it's not i won't even say barely visible 
scar scar is never visible and uh, second i mean uh, in how many percentage of your cases you get entrapment of extraocular muscle that is extraocular movement impairment yes sir overall you are seeing orbital fracture either in association with zygomatic fracture or an isolated floor fracture yes sir how much percentage you get uh, extraocular movement is impact Uh, sir, uh, to, to, to be frank, I cannot commit percentage. Sir, let us take numbers. Like, if we get ten uh, fractures, two to three cases, we get uh, 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 entrapment of uh, the you, soft tissue or muscle. Yeah, persistent uh, impairment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay. We can say that means. On the other hand, two to three. I even like to say one to two. That is an eight. I mean, surprisingly, in eighty yes. to ninety percent of cases. We don't, we don't get see extraocular movement impairment. You see, yes, even sir. the worst of uh, rim fractures or multiple fracturing yes, fractures, this extraocular yes, impairment is one of the very rare finding. Yes, In fact, we will be looking for it to see and yes, uh, to this. Okay, I share the same thing. Like how do you, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, how do you select the material for floor augmentation? Sir, do you have uh, criteria or any? Sir. Uh, selection. We always prefer titanium mesh only, sir. We assess the uh, uh, peroperatively. We assess the size uh, because uh, we have got implants based on consignment basis. We have got uh, two companies, so peroperatively we assess the defect. If it is uh, two centimeter or less than that, we will go for that base plate type. If it is a little bit, uh, if it is more than two centimeter, then we would like to go for a preformed anatomical plate, sir. We go like that. We go like that. We have how much? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. How much dissection you suggest along the floor? Is there any landmark I have to dissect up to here, or I have to go beyond that, like that? Sir, uh, as I said, uh, 30 millimeter. We we take it as a uh, safe uh, limit of dissection, but uh, uh, like we we would not like to go beyond the uh, 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 inferior orbital fissures, sir. Where at times we have ablated certain structures in the inferior orbital fissure. We have taken out the structures and we have gone beyond that. But uh, for the uh, beyond 30 millimeters, we usually uh, hesitate to go beyond that, sir. You mean to say you stop at the level of inferior orbital fissure? Yes, sir. Little, little bit. We go little bit, sir. We have even uh, taken out the structures in the inferior orbital fissure. We have gone little bit, but uh, not beyond that, sir. We we don't go beyond that. So any problem in the infraorbital fissure you normally encounter you have to dissect beyond that so uh, what is the thing in the infraorbital sir structure? mostly the uh, uh, dissection of the soft tissues only sir dissection of the soft tissues that we uh, we face uh, regularly we uh, not regularly for uh, certain cases we face that uh, dissection sir dissection of the structures soft tissues uh, along the infraorbital fissures sometimes uh, entrapment we have to check whether we have, we are Uh, just dissecting the muscle, or we are actually we are uh, dissecting the structures in the infraorbital thing. That, that's what we face a little bit difficulty, sir. We face difficulty in that area. Uh, I personally feel because infraorbital because structures are coming into the orbit through the infraorbital fissure. Yes, sir. We have to go. We have to cut those structures. Yes, sir. We 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 don't hesitate, sir. We try to preserve. If not, we 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 cut the we we ablate the structure, sir. Yes. Yeah, one of the, yeah, you ablate because one of the common things that comes is the communication of the inferior ophthalmic vein with the pterygoid. Yes, yes, sir. So you dissect only with the bipolar diathermy. Yes, sir. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, once you cut it, it it disappears down, which will not be in our field of vision. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have this uh, thing. Otherwise, you routinely prefer a titanium mesh, isn't it? Yes, sir. Because of the availability and yeah. uh, ease of access, sir. But at times, uh, patient uh, they may not uh, afford a titanium plate. In that case, we go for a conical cartilage, sir. But if the defect is uh, large, then uh, we convince the patient to go for a titanium mesh. We have not uh, used a bone graft, or we have not used a polyethylene porous polyethylene sheet, sir. We have no experience with that. I have just one uh, this thing. Yes, sir. I personally prefer conical cartilage as the if the defect is two centimeter, two centimeter by two centimeter. Yes, sir. And uh, are you? I think you can see this is the two centimeter piece. Yes, sir. So small. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can. But, understand, sir. Huh? but when you, I think you are able to see. Yes, sir. When you 
into the R bed. I think we can one can appreciate the orbit. Yes, sir. Sir, I can see, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so all of you can see that orbit, but this is centimeter by two centimeter. In fact, it extends up to the infraorbital pressure, and it covers the whole of the floor of the orbit. When you go medially, it's almost eight might from here. This two centimeter by two centimeter. Sir, can you outside just, it looks. Can you just lift a little more, sir? Specimen. Lift it a little more. Ah uh, yeah. How is it now? Uh, it has to face downward. It has to look downward. Oh. Ah yes sir. Yes sir. Huh? Yes sir. It's okay. Yeah. So this is a two centimeter by two centimeter defect on the floor of the orbit. Though outside it looks small, inside it covers most of the floor area. This is often I have uh, noticed that because I go with the idea my conical cartilage may not be enough, and uh, most cases the defect is. Less than this, because you can see I am putting it inside. I hope you are seeing it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am seeing it. Sir. Yeah. So this is exactly a two centimeter by defect. Of course, we have to take a little bit of larger conical cartilage graft. One thing I personally feel is something we can never bother about the infection. But of course, larger than that, you have to use the prosthetic plate. And when you use these things. the uh, implant the most preferred implant is a titanium it there's no doubt about it yes, because elastic or porous everything else the complication is far more and only thing is there is though any implant so because it is in close proximity with the maxillary sinus and the sinus never heals because there is always a communication but incidence of infection is surprisingly very less in very titanium less. we have so, not we have not come across sir, yeah. sir actually to, to be frank we started with the conical cartilage sir when we started uh, orbital surgeries uh, because we we are in our hospital is in a area where the people are belongs to lower socio economic status but contrary to our belief when we say that we have to take a tissue from the ear for the reconstruction uh, we we faced a very strong objection from the patients they say that they and we we, we even or then uh, when we opted for a mesh titanium mesh plate to our surprise uh they were able, they, they said they are willing to pay rather than uh, going for a, another procedure in the ear so uh, const, i mean so that gave a confidence to us and we started uh, strongly suggesting titanium mesh plate uh, very rarely we, uh, right now we use uh, conical cartilage sir. but uh, we, uh, like uh, uh, we, uh, our thing is uh, we don't deny conical cartilage but uh, our experience uh, made us uh, just to go ahead with the uh, titanium mesh sir. yeah again one more thing is as you have very rightly said you know there are two component the enophthalmus and hypophthalmus so whatever we correct uh, floor reconstruct the floor if we correct the hypophthalmus if you want to correct the enophthalmus you have to go posteriorly that yes. is when you go inferiorly and posterior posterior there, there is a gradual tilt of the floor towards the posterior unless our graft or our implant goes beyond that area the true enough thalamus will be very difficult to correct yes. so yeah that is one thing i think you have specifically told these two points hypothalamus and is titanium mesh is that posterior part is little bent or it is straight sir uh, uh, when we go for that base plate type uh, we find it little bit uh, hard to contour sir it is so whenever we get a chance we go for that uh, contoured plate sir so that uh, it gives the proper uh, lift to the globe Yeah, this posterior part is preferably a little bent. Yes. Sir. And in that case, only a hyper enough thalamus can get corrected. Yes. Sir. Yes. Again, that infection, it's not not as uh, bad as feared. Yes. Sir. In the titanium mesh, and so many papers have come. Yes. Sir. But unfortunately, yes, sir. I went through many papers. None of them, because everybody preferred their uh, surgery. People have used bone graft. People have used. same persons have not compared cartilage and bone or cartilage and mesh or like that so it is that is a thing but certainly what the most important thing is your dissection your yes, dissection and your willingness to go posteriorly yes, beyond infraorbital fissure yes sir because after infraorbital fissure only the posterior wall bends yes sir uh, uh, the floor goes little up uh, yes sir and, yeah only at that place the enough thalamus will get corrected okay. thank you now we thank you sir. invite questions Sir, um, there are a few questions in the chat box, sir. You are able to see them, sir. Where? 
Or shall I just read out the questions? Uh, yeah, fine. Uh, Dr. Alamelu has asked, in both videos, what fractures you dealt with and how did you manage? Madam, uh, uh, the subtarsal was uh, a rim fracture, madam. It, it is a rim fracture. It is not a pole fracture. Just I uh, posted the video to show the approach, right? And the other thing, we went for the floor fracture. The subconjunct transconjunctival approach video is the uh, for floor fracture, madam. Floor fracture. Yeah. There is a question from Dr. Balasundaram. In case of orbital rim displaced fractures with floor of the orbit, do you use a separate plate for the rim, pore hole with gap? And then a titanium mesh, which is also fixed to the rim. Definitely, definitely, we fix the rim before uh, dealing with the orbital floor. We we fix with the plate, then we deal with the uh, floor. We go for a uh, titanium mesh. Doctor Inciet, sir, you have any comments on that? Yeah, in, naturally, most of the even recently, two days back, yesterday or day before yesterday, we had one orbital fracture. Orbit was in five segments. So once. And it's about a one month or 40 days old injury referred from climb tour and all that. But once we reconstruct the rim from various uh, this thing, we could see the floor. The defect of the floor hardly comes less than two centimeters. Because when we use multiple plates and there is going to be multiple pathways leading into the sinus, the chance of infection is more, the more hardware we are putting it. So if the autogenous cartilage, a conchal cartilage, is uh, can be can bridge that uh, defect. I prefer that only. No doubt about it. There's a chance of infection. There's nothing like cartilage graft. And again, there is a fundamental difference between a cartilage graft and a bone graft. You know, the bone graft take is very very precise. You know, the bone has to your graft has to be in contact with the bone. Cartilage that is not the thing. Even if you put in the partly in the soft tissue or partly in the this thing, it takes very well. Uh, again, there are instances after mesh infection, and because I know my because my basically I have my thing is in ENT. I am always aware of the complications of acute sinusitis and complication of CSOM. And you see an orbital cellulitis and orbital abscess happening. So nothing else we can do except to remove those implants. So the more and more hardware you have to put, the more and more you have to be careful. Naturally, that will make you a uh, little more nervous on a long term. Because once you put an implant, the infection means it's not six months or one year, it's lifelong. They may get a sinusitis after a few years, and if they have a complication, orbital complication, it's going to be a problem. But, uh, but still, surprisingly, the incidence of infection with titanium mesh in all the papers, I don't know whether those papers are biased or not, all those papers are written by people who do only titanium mesh implant. They are not compared with the other kind of implants. That's it. <laughs> yes, sir. There is a question from P. Umar Farooq Baba. In subtarsal incision, sometimes long-term edema becomes a problem. Any take on this edema? Uh, see, uh, if we, that depends uh, primarily, the post-op edema depends primarily on the pre-op status of the uh, uh, lower eyelid also. If we see a pro, uh, preoperatively, if we see a patient with a, a consistent edema, then uh, we what we follow is we allow the edema to settle. We patient we put the patient on uh, antibiotics, anti-edema drugs. We wait for uh, uh, 72 hours, or or else uh, we even advise the patient to come back after five days. Then we take up the surgery. And post-op edema. Thing is, uh, my my take on the post-op edema is uh, mainly it depends on the dissection. If the dissection is uh, very precise and it is, uh, if we follow the anatomy, I think uh, the, we can avoid the post-op edema. If in case you develop post-op edema, if we think that the patient will develop a post-op edema, like what we suggest is we go for frost sutures, and uh, uh, that is the thing mainly. And uh, we uh, commonly use. Uh, uh, we routinely use uh, uh, steroids, dexamethasone, for 72 hours to uh, uh, combat uh, edema. Yeah. Uh, is, I mean, so. He suggested, uh, uh, I mean, proper dissection. In fact, I like to emphasize proper repair when you come back. You know, if you, because I'm, 
never use a high profile plate in the infra orbital the plate should not impair with your orbicular is muscle put a very low profile plate and if possible it may not be possible in badly comminuted fracture close the peri ostium or peri or thing over that plate and then repair the orbital uh, orbicular is uh, muscle and then repair mm -hmm. the skin and then post Operatively, ask the patient for vigorous massage. That should not be an adherent develop, uh, adherence developing between the orbicular muscle and your plate. If that is free, edema will never develop. And I have not encountered the edema problem. If it is persistent, sometimes it is adherent. You keep massaging, even after two three days. Advise the patient to have a massage after a week. Vigorous massage that not only prevents the ectropia, it prevents the edema as well. And sir, sir. Yeah, uh, sir. Sir said, uh, "One is the proper repair after uh, putting the uh, plate in proper position. Proper closure of the wound. We have to do uh, do a meticulous closure, meticulous closure of the periorbita, meticulous closure of the orbicularis, and the care should be taken in the closure. Then we can avoid edema." Yeah, I think uh, there are a few more questions. We have time only for one more question uh, from Doctor Shashank. How do you approach an orbital floor fracture with medial orbital wall involvement? See, same uh, like uh, we uh, subtarsal, we go for a uh, medial extension. See, like it is just a uh, 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 isolated medial wall. We can go for a lateral nasal incision. Sometimes, if it is associated with the floor, then we go for a medial extension. And uh, if we if we are uh, tackling the floor uh, through a uh, transconjunctival, then uh, as I said, we can go for a Uh, medial uh, current color incision extension. We can approach the uh, medial wall. So again, the medial orbital wall. It depends upon the medial canthal ligament. Either you are going to tackle with it, and there is disinsertion of the medial canthal yes. ligament. You are planning for canthal. See, it depends on that. If the canthal ligament is fine, only infra canthal area you are going to see or augment. You can have the same approach. Yes, There's hardly yes, any need. Same sub tarsal, whatever tarsal incision yes, will do. But if you are combining with the medial canthal avulsion is there, then you have to do a canthal pexy. Then it Definitely. becomes uh, 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 no longer it is an isolated floor fracture floor because fracture. the canthal thing has to be approached and canthal pexy has to be done. If that determines to what extent you have to dissect medial orbital wall. And again, remember. Optic now is in relation with the medial orbital wall. Yes, <laughs> rightly mentioned that uh, thing. We used to tell about the rule of uh, six something, twelve, twenty-four, uh, thirty-six. Like yes, that sir. is come anterior artery, posterior. Anterior atmal, posterior atmal artery is nothing. You can just coagulate with the thing. Okay. Beyond that, you have to be extra, extra careful. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. There are other questions regarding naso orbital atmal fractures and blow-in fractures. i think it's beyond the scope and we are running out of time thank you so much dr alagar raja for a very you, nice sir. presentation and thank, thank you, you very much uh, professor nc h sir for your uh, time and sharing your experience thank you Would sir you like to sum up before we close sir uh, yeah just few this thing i really i invite i encourage people to take up this orbit fractures every class you take it orbit uh, one need not be scared of it unless you this is where you can show that you are different from surgeons of other related specialties because they are if we are afraid we can be damn sure that they are more afraid because that is what my experience shows when the orbit is involved the case is always referred otherwise they make an attempt and start with the floor floor is a very safest place i told you as i told you medial orbital wall is far more dangerous there will be bleeding at two three places and then of course the optic nerve comes and floor is a very safe place you can very easily go up to the inferior orbital fissure only significant things come from the inferior orbital fissure even then it's only the maxillary branch of uh, this uh, nerve and then the some vessels you can even go beyond that when you are approaching the floor and uh, take it up as far as the uh, implant is concerned i will you start doing with autograft because it's safer in you initially you should not get infection once you gain more and especially for larger defects go for the mesh and remember you want to correct the enough thalamus which is the most difficult part to correct and um, you have to go posteriorly that is in the floor should go where it where it turns gently curves upwards unless you go that part that is unless you go posterior to the globe 
you can't correct the enough thalamus only you will keep correcting hypo hypothalamus second the regarding the uh, impairment of extraocular movement originally the blow out fracture is uh, described you know it is called the trap door fracture trap door has two elements one the door opens then the door closes if that happens in a blow out fracture so when you see there may not be a fracture but there will be significant entrapment i have encountered only two such cases in fact not only upward that totally movement of eyeball is restricted in all the directions this i encountered in a case where an ent surgeon has done a fess accidentally he entered the floor of the orbit small thing and that uh, like a trap door it got closed and the muscle got stick there will be a restricted movement in all directions of the eyeball and repeated ct showed only the there is an adherent no definitive fracture also was there so this trap door component is very much important to cause restriction of the extraocular movement to cause entrapment of the extraocular muscles or extraocular tissues so most of the time when we see a large fracture the, the extraocular movement will be normal only that's what we surprisingly see in most cases thank you okay sir thank you again uh, dr alagaraja and professor thank you sir thank you very much